This is part three of a presentation on the proposed federal mining tax and constitutional and legal issues. A relevant question is whether this is a Commonwealth tax on state property. And we come to section 114 of the Constitution which says that nor shall the Commonwealth impose any tax on property of any kind belonging to a state. And this will be one of the arguments, or one of the arguments which the states could raise in relation to the mining tax. The argument being that the minerals are owned by the state, they're vested in the state, that is in the crown in the right of the state. There are a number of cases as to what is a tax on property, and these are listed on the, this particular slide. Stamp duty, for, an act, for example, is not a tax on property, it's a tax on a document. And what are taxes on property, according to the precedents, are shown on the right-hand side. In Considering whether the Commonwealth has a power to tax, a power to impose tax on royalties, Section 51 of the Constitution should be taken as the initial part of examining those powers. Section 51 provides that the Parliament shall, that means the Federal Parliament shall, subject to this Constitution, have power to make laws for the peace, order and good government of the Commonwealth with respect to trade and commerce and taxation, but so as not to discriminate between states or parts of states. And external affairs. Also, there's a provision in the Constitution allowing the Commonwealth to acquire property on just terms from any state or person for any purpose in respect of which the Parliament has power to make laws. The initial part of the tax was raised, was said to be an acquisition of property but not on just terms. That was because it imposed a tax of 40% on super profits but also proposed that the Commonwealth would incur 40% of the losses on any venture. That raises the issue, what is an acquisition? There you see the farmer, Peter Spencer, protesting because he says that the use of his property has been neutralized. It's been declared to be a carbon sink to comply with the Kyoto Protocol. Therefore, he can't use it. He says that the Commonwealth has conspired or agreed with the states that the states would effectively neutralize the use of his property and that's an acquisition not on just terms and in breach of the Constitution. And there's Mr. Noel Pearson who says that the Queensland legislation which stops development in northern Queensland in native title areas for environmental purposes is in effect a nationalization or acquisition. Where the external affairs power is relevant is that it was said that in relation to the first version of the federal mining tax, it breached 22 international treaties under which the Commonwealth had pledged to protect foreign investment, and that included provisions which protected foreign investment from retrospective taxation. And this relates to existing ventures in Australia. Whether that will be raised in relation to the second tax, the tax which was the result of negotiations between, on the one hand, the Prime Minister and the Treasurer, and on the other hand, only the three major foreign investors, is yet to be seen. These breaches, it was said, could lead to Australia facing international arbitration before an agency of the World Bank in Washington, which could result in the federal government having to pay compensation to foreign companies. 
Now it would be open under the second tax for some of the smaller foreign investors to still claim retrospective breach. Just some terms, sovereign risk, the ANZ says sovereign risk implies the possibility that conditions will develop in a country which inhibit payment or repayment of funds due from the country, such as exchange controls, strikes, declarations of war, and so on. And an internal, an international lender compensates for perceived sovereign risk by adjusting the rate of interest. And it was said after the first tax was announced that uh, this, under the concept of foreign risk, would mean that foreign lenders, international lenders, would see a sovereign risk in Australia which did not exist before. That is, that Australia would retrospectively change taxes or impose taxes which were unreasonably high and therefore rates of interest charged by foreign lenders would increase to compensate for that. The other was country risk. And the ANZ defines that as the risk associated with dealing with another country including legal, political, currency and settlement risks. Reg Nelson, a geophysicist with the CEO of Beach Petroleum, went on record as saying, in relation to the first tax, I answered the phone this week to a familiar draw. Have you guys down there, down there gone crazy? Why wouldn't waste a lousy Yankee penny, let alone a proud Texan dollar on your banana republic? You're worse than Chavez. Nelson said the damage has already been done. Our country is no longer seen as a stable place in which to invest resource dollars. Overseas investors see through the flimsy facade of the resource super profits tax to its core, that is, of an opportunistic tax. The tax as enunciated has nothing to do with resources, nor rental, nor royalties. It's not a tax on super profits whatever they may be. Well, that is just one view suggesting that there would be a disincentive for foreign investors to come to Australia. Well, the Constitution and the Federal Mining Tax, to sum up, raises issues. Is such a tax within the power of the Federal Parliament? Is it a Commonwealth tax on state property? Is it an acquisition or nationalisation. It's unlikely this will be raised in relation to the second tax. And finally, is the tax in breach of Australia's international obligations? And the general point, not a legal point, but the general point, is this consistent with federalism, where the principle of federalism is that the states be fiscally independent, that they raise the taxes they need so that they can be accountable to their electors for what they have spent. That is the context, the constitutional and philosophical context of a federal mining tax.